The Team Never Quit podcast is sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. Members of Navy Federal can enjoy a hassle-free car buying experience. You can learn all about this at NavyFederal.org. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Team Never Quit podcast. As always, thank you guys for listening, watching, viewing, and please go hit that like and subscribe button wherever you get your show. So today we are going to throw it back to an older episode of ours, a rebroadcast of one of our very good friends, Aaron Kendall, who happens to have one of the craziest, most outrageous, and kind of funny and disturbing uh, stories all mixed into one. Um, Just whenever you think the story is finished, it just keeps building and getting better and crazier. And you are going to want to keep into this one till the very end. I promise you that. So with that being said, let's get to it. So we're joined today by one of my best friends. He was one of my groomsmen. We go back. And vice versa. And vice versa. That's right. Vice versa. Aaron Kendall. Actually, his wife was calling him by his first name yesterday. And I was like, who the hell are you talking about? She's like, Kendall. I was like, oh, I forgot his name was Aaron. Yeah, people in San Antonio. Oh, it was A.A. Ron. A-A it Ron. is A.A. Ron. I actually have your last name misspelled in my phone. Still. A.A. Hey, Ron, are you here? I think everybody does. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So as again, never quit story. But um, so for everybody out there, we're talking to uh, Aaron Kendall, who is former retired, team guy, yeah. retired team guy. He's got the sexiest half arm on the planet. <laughs> Which we got to get into that story because it's literally yeah, it's the greatest story, story in naval special warfare. warfare. Like one of those, warfare. like one of those, you actually did that to yourself, and then <laughs> sounded made get up back to the house. Yeah. So his, <laughs> yeah. So one of his best stories, because like I said, we've known him forever. One of the best stories he's got is when. When it didn't even happen at work. Yeah, you guys need me with two hands. Gut riching, yeah. There's gonna be a lot of one handed jokes in here tonight. Yeah, and if you hey, As look, while we're going be. through this, if you need a hand with anything, just let us know. <laughs> we'll we'll, we'll uh, yeah, we'll make sure that yeah, we'll we'll give you yeah, we'll help Always. you out. We'll give you, yeah. We're pretty handy around here. So, so before we jump into the nitty gritty of the never quit story, um, give us some background on where you're from. Because uh, all right, so in really, so what we like to do is we like to put everything on relative terms. Because the listeners out there, especially with the team guys, they think that team guys are kind of like born out of this certain genotype. And we like to express to our, our listeners that, hey, we come from everywhere, every walk of life, and that every one of our stories are different. So anything that we've been involved in or our never quit stories, we're just kind of an, an average human being that was put in an extra or extraordinary situation. So let's kick this bad boy off and give a little background on Kendall. I mean, so I started working out when I was about two years old, training. Most people don't do that. <laughs> Why'd you wait so long? <laughs> I'm a, I was a little slow, but no. Uh, I actually think I was, I was, my childhood, everything in my life was pretty normal. I came from a military family. I've got a long history of military from my parents, kind of in the Vietnam era, to my grandfather on both sides in World War II. Uh, to my great grandfather in World War One, so that's awesome, man. Thanks. For yeah, that. no, I mean, um, carrying the torch, American warrior class, <laughs> sort of was. I mean, I guess that was my grandfather. Definitely would have been a, a big influence on me for that. But I grew up normal, into sports. I played everything. Start where are you off, from originally? Manassas, Virginia. Yeah, nobody knows where that is. Yeah, it's just outside of D.C., a little small town. Shout out to Manassas. Manasty. <laughs> my people's Manasty. Yeah. <laughs> Some people might say Manassas, but uh, no, I love it. It's growing. It's a small town back then, but <laughs> it's growing now. But uh, I was born in the Philippines. My parents were both back to duty, Civic Bay Naval Base. Both in the Navy? They both were. My dad was in the Marine jet, Corps. Right? Yeah, my dad was in the Marine Corps, joined up in Vietnam, and then um, ended up getting a commissioning and going over to the Navy. Was just a line officer for a number of years. But my mom, yeah, she was a JAG lawyer. I forgot about that. Yeah. She stayed in, retired as a captain. Um, my stepdad, he's also a 20-year F-14 guy. Uh, so oh, cool. I just, 14, huh? Yeah. Top Gunner? That's right. He went to Top Gun, what's actually. His call, what's his call sign? Smoke. What's that stand for? Uh, I don't even school. know. <laughs> <Obviously> <laughs> yeah. You know what? I'll have to ask him after cool. this. Yeah. Bill, what does, cool. Bill, what does that stand for? <laughs> uh, 
but normal childhood sports school i don't think i was much of a student i mean i just got by uh my parents divorced when i was young i think i was seven years old so i grew up with my dad and my brother there in manassas uh my dad worked out of dc as a civilian most of my life he actually worked for the jag corps up in navy washington yard so i grew up going to base and meeting guys and always seeing guys in uniform but like I said, I never really had that drive. I never thought about the military being my thing. I ended up finding my niche in swimming. I was a great swimmer. I grew up top in the state of Virginia and breaststroke and stuff. But it wasn't until I graduated high school, barely. I think I graduated like a 1.2. Yeah. And uh, Can't be my dad was old school. He always has this rule of, you know, either have a job, be going to school, or get out of the house. Obviously, I was living at home still. So I was going to community college, signed up there, figured I'd still swim community college and then end up transferring somewhere still. And I, during this time, I think I started thinking, you know, what's my backup plan? I started looking at the SEALs. I met a SEAL that worked at the Navy Washington Yard and he gave me one of these books. I can't even remember which one it was. It talked a little bit about each special forces training. The commando. Yeah, I think that was it. Yep. So I read that yeah, and cool. it kind of piqued my interest in the SEAL thing. Obviously, I was comfortable in the water. And I was going to school, reading all these SEAL books, which immediately made me a, an expert at all things SEAL related. But the fuck was that? Did you hear that? Yeah. That was, what was that? Settle down, buddy. Was that him? <laughs> <laughs> fucking Quato trying to come out of his belly over here. Uh, Did you get that on? He ordered the special? I don't know. Oh, <laughs> was loud. I was like, hey, what did he get? The special? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Check, please. Uh, <laughs> All right. Uh, sorry, bro. But yeah, anyway, but anyway, yeah, yeah so um, I was still super mature. I, I didn't even finish the semester before. I was finally like, hey, partying with my All right, friends. So people know, man, the, you're, you're highly intelligent. Your grades obviously don't reflect your, what's really going on. So yeah, I was just, I was just getting, at an immature point in my life. Right. I just needed to mature. Right. And so I dropped my classes, was still living at home. My dad came home back in those days. He didn't need a password and ID to figure out everything. He just, he knew my social, my date of birth. And he looked on, he came home that day, asked me how school was going. I said, it's going <laughs> I great. I lied. Mm -hmm. I did. I lied. I said, it's great. And he said, great. Like you got all A's or great. Like you dropped all your classes and haven't told me yet. Uh, I knew I was after so right there. So are you so, giving me an A and B option here? Yeah. Or, uh... <laughs> but he made it. He said, what's next? You're about to be gone. And I said, I'm joining the Navy. He was like, bullshit. You quit everything you do. <laughs> and I was like, nope, I'm going to do it. I want to be a SEAL. So he supported me. I went, enlisted, and uh, chose to be a medic. Waited nine months to get in, and off to boot camp I went. I forgot you were a corpsman. Yeah. What year did you jump in? I came in in... 2003. Oh, yeah. Nice. Right at the time. Old school, back when core school was still at Great Lakes. It's right. in San Antonio now. Yeah. Oh, you had to go to core school? Yeah. I didn't. I was a striker. Oh, were you? Yeah. I want, uh, So I. that was the fastest way to get to Buds. Yeah. Come to find out, it's the longest way to get to the SEAL teams. Because <laughs> the guys I graduated with had their tridents and had already been on a deployment and come back. And I, I was still in the, in the pipeline. Yeah. I mean, I was three and a half years before I got to my team. Cause I was SDV and then and con school and all kinds of stuff. In the I mean, back. I think that's the medic way. Cause I didn't, I mean, maybe after buds, I remember like third phase, you know, we'd pretty much made it and they're calling out or getting everybody orders. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. just went alphabetically, you know, and they're like, <laughs> you know, so-and-so team four, so-and-so team seven. And all of a sudden, like my name got skipped. Fate I was will. like, <laughs> I'm like, what's going on here? I'm starting to sweat. Like, dude, what happened? And then, of course, I realized other guys' names weren't called either. And they were like, hey, if your name wasn't called, you're a medic. You're going to 18 Delta. Yeah. You're like, what the fuck is 18 Delta? <laughs> I just thought, when I chose a job, I just chose it because I was like, man, I grew up as a lifeguard. I yeah, was like, I know, I know CPR. I can be a medic. <laughs> I know, right? Not realizing it's one of the hardest schools <laughs> in the military. Yeah. Oh, that, was a, that was a kick in so the So for ball. the listeners out there who don't know what 18 Delta is, what is that? I guess uh, so. 18 Delta is what the SEAL medics used to go through. Now we, they've started their own program. Now I think they have their own medical course. So the way it works with the the in the in the Green Berets, their 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 source ratings are, are identified by uh, letter a number codes. and a letter. Yeah, yeah, number and a letter. All right. In the SEAL teams, you got your source code, which is where 5326. So if you see that number 5326, like on the Mustang, in the Navy, everything is, has a number tacked to it. Right. That's your identification number. Well, SEALs is 5326. And then if as you're if you're a medic, then you're a 5326 and then 8491, right? 
And then if you're an SDV guy, it's 5323. So you just stack these numbers up. And the way it works in the with the Green Berets is as they're going through their pipeline, their selection course, right? When they make it through, so their buds part of it, then they go to their their qualification training. So if they're a medic, a comm guy, a, a, an explosive guy, officers or alphas, then you got uh, Bravos. So 18 series denotes special forces. Special forces yeah. Okay. And then after that, if it has an A, B, C, D behind it, that tells you what he is, what he, what his job description is. So if they're 18 deltas, then that means that they're the medic. Seals don't go through regular. People would ask me, I was like, I'm in the Navy, and like you're, a, I was a medic. Like, oh, so you, you're a corpsman? You went to corps school? I was like, no, I, I didn't do that. I went from bud straight to 18 delta. And it's also you have the PJs, the Air Force Special Forces are there, the Rangers Special Forces. Everybody goes there. It's the most high end medical school. You, you can go to in the military in the military and uh it's the longest route so when you uh when you hear that or if you hear any special forces guys talking and they're like oh i was sf and like well, what would you do and they'll say well i was a golf or a bravo or a delta or a charlie or something like that awesome so, I, so yeah went through delta school how'd you do <laughs> I passed. There you go. <laughs> Got that doctorate degree. 75 and a snowflake, right? That's right. 74 and a snowflake. <laughs> All right, so Delta and then, then then into the teams. Yep, and I uh, I got my orders. I chose to go back to the West Coast, um, picked up my orders for SEAL Team 7, and showed back up there kind of right in the middle of, of the workup. Um, did, they, did you get your orders out of SD, uh, muster at, SD, at, at 18 Delta? I did get my orders at 18 Delta, yeah. I remember that morning, man, we mustered up down there, and they were reading there, but it was just us, right? Because yeah. maybe some of the Ranger guys, but they started going down the list, too. And they got to my name, they are like, Trell, where do you think you're going? And I was like, uh, three? And like, try again. I was like, five? <laughs> you know, I started going down the numbers. I want to go West Coast, too. And they were like, nope, it's three letters. I was like, dev group? <laughs> 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 I'll be honest. I was I would have been happy with any orders out of there as fast as yeah, possible because right? I, I mean, end up getting it. I had gotten some trouble with the law when I was on rotations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The last month, you, where'd you go do your rotation at? In uh, Jacksonville, Florida. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so I had gotten arrested down there. Right. Like two days before we left. Of course. And of course, I came back up there and just the guy, the other seals I knew knew, and I was like, dude, I can't. We can't tell anybody. They'll kick me out of here. We're a week away from graduating. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I didn't say a word. Typical seal story. Because it's still it's still a selection course for the uh for the special force guys so it's like we're, we're, they drop us into a portion of their seal their yeah. buds training right and i mean they're trying to get those guys out of there with us man we we made it through the pro the pipeline and they need us to become medics so we can go back right but it's still i mean i, I got my ass kicked in that class well plus it's the army i don't think every, they like yeah, us anyway man <laughs> around like midnight you hear that knock on the door being there studying and starts like get yeah, out i still get wet sandy all that <laughs> stuff man it was a a joy yeah, so I mean, I did uh, went to SEAL Team Seven. I did my first platoon there, beautiful Southeast Asia, which was awesome. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think at first everybody was a little bitter because I think you know Iraq was going. Everybody wanted to be in Iraq, but we were the we were the troop that got stuck to Southeast Asia. I think I was bitter about that for a while, but looking back now, that was like one of the best deployments. Fun, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. I wish I could. I wish I would have like enjoyed myself more. But um, came back from that, ended up going to sniper school. Of course, I wanted to be a breacher. My platoon chief said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to go to breacher school. He said, you're going to be a sniper. Oh, good. Go to sniper school. Which was awesome. The opposite. Uh, yeah. in, in the teams, you know, those are, that's like crossing the streams. Yeah. You get every qual you want, but if, if you're a breacher, then you stay that. If you're a yeah. sniper, then you stay that. Uh, sniper school was awesome, though. Uh, there were two guys from dev group in there. Um, one guy was Colin Thomas, who unfortunately isn't with us anymore. He got killed a few years later, but I mean, he's, he was an awesome guy. And the other is sniper partner as well. I won't use names, but that was like the first time I got like a glimpse of like, I'll be, where are you guys at? This looks awesome. And you guys are awesome. And they were just, they treated us great. And that kind of sparked my ambition to go to dev group. Uh, I came back from sniper school and they were still doing augments. So when the squadrons would deploy, they would take medics and guys like that. And I was obviously a medic, which was great. So I volunteered, I got permission and got to go over there. Uh, I did a deployment with them to Afghanistan which was amazing and came back from that. And that kind of solidified it for me. I knew I wanted to screen and I'm doing my second deployment at a seven to Iraq. 
And I screened right before that in that period. I came back, did the whole screening process, deployed with Team 7, uh, came back, and I ended up getting picked up. And so for, for people who aren't familiar with, with the way that one works either, this is, the SEAL teams, are it's a, it's a volunteer force, double volunteer, right? And then Dev Group's triple volunteer force. So you volunteer for the Navy, and you volunteer for Naval Special Warfare. And then you go through BUDS, and then uh, SQT, and you get to your team. And you, you do work up and stuff like that. And then as you're doing that, if, if you want to screen for Dev Group or SEAL Team 6, there's another selection process. So you, you just like when you screen for Bud, you got to do the push-ups, pull-ups, sit up, swims, and run, all that stuff like that. And then afterwards, there's a, another program called Green Team, which is the, it's like Bud, right? It's just, but for team guys. And it sucks, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just a different kind of tough. It's more right. mental and skill yeah, because you're getting evaluated. Getting you're your already a team guy. Yeah, it's it's uh, right. so the guys who do that, man, that's something. So you got over to the squadrons. Just some time over to squadrons. I'm gonna I'm gonna push you through this one. Yeah, I mean, a couple of deployments there, and then uh, end up finishing my time on the West Coast, uh, teaching skydiving. Ran the sky, gotten all things jumping there. I forgot Decker. you were doing that. And then I was the chief of the air cell on the West Coast. Uh, handful of guys in there, and we put all the SEAL teams through the air portion of their workup which was an awesome job i started going back to school there we can, i'm sure we're going to get into all this uh got into the nonprofit world and yeah we'll get back to that so yeah. f- f- so for, for everyone out there so what you've done already is you, you enlisted in went through the seal teams did time on the west coast went over across the street to uh damn neck did, did your time over there and then now let's get into your into the never quit story about your about your arm you want to go into that one or no that's, one, that's a fun that answer that's, that's Save that till the end. I don't know. Maybe we can talk about it. Yeah, we'll talk about it. All right. Well, okay. I know which one you're going for. Yeah, let's do that one. Uh, yeah, we've kind of already talked about. It. Obviously, Morgan and I, shit, we live together. Yeah, that's roommates. actually how I met you guys was through a good buddy of mine going through Green Team. Met a bunch of great guys. One of my best friends being John Tomlinson, JT, and was blessed to be introduced to all you guys going through because it's, it's tough coming from the West Coast. You know, we, you, when you come from the West Coast here, I didn't, I knew a handful of guys in the East Coast, but your T80 order as you're living in the barracks. So it wasn't until we finished and it was like, where are we going to live? You know, JT was like, hey, I, yeah. Morgan's on deployment. You should just crash at his house. <laughs> that's, that's how I got to do this. I was like, hey, we got a new roommate. And I was like, all right, cool. <laughs> He's like, Morgan said it was cool. But um, obviously leading up to like one of my things, a big event in my life that kind of started some never quit stuff was, you know, August 6, 2011. Um, I was at the squadron. We were deployed. Same and, squadron. What's right. that? Same squadron as JT. Yeah, we were same squadron. We were lucky enough. And different troops. I was at an outstation down in Kandahar. These guys were one of the two troopers all together. And um, I can remember the, the night we came back in from an op, do our usual you know, debrief, after action reports, send everything up have a quick cocktail and I went, I went to my room and I just changed and laid down and my team leader, I hear just bang on the door. Of course, I'm like, what? So I answer the door and he's like, get into the jock here. It's just a small one. We walk in on the TV is just this fiery crash, you know, and you're just kind of like, what's going on? And then he, it just like, it just, it just happened. Obviously those guys were all on one helo. If you don't know, and the helo ended up getting, shot down as they were coming in to land um on an op and we lost an entire troop you know i think there's 31 guys total 25 mm-hmm. bars um you're just watching it you know it's kind of surreal like you don't you don't even know how to react like, yeah. it's not real it's like watching on tv it is like watching on tv it's right? like watching a movie like you're kind of emotionless uh, you're like during your gut you're like who was on that uh, and, and we knew, you know, and we knew you know. everybody was on there and, you know, you're looking at me, I'm at, I'm looking at my teammate and I'm at, we're asking questions that we don't know the answer to. And we're just, you know, obviously the rest of this squadron all over the world was started communicating very quickly and talking. And like I said, it was just, it was terrible. So I think those emotions start to come slowly <laughs> and you just kind of don't know what to do.
Okay, so who doesn't love sleeping, am I right? I used to dread it because I sleep really hot and have a toss and turn all night long. But that all changed when I discovered My Sheets Rock, the ultimate bedding brand that has revolutionized my sleep forever. And let me tell you, these sheets are softer than Cloud9 itself. The regulator sheets by My Sheets Rock are designed specifically to keep hot sleepers cool and cold sleepers comfortable. You can say goodbye to all these restless nights and hello to the best sleep of your life. They regulate temperature, wick moisture, they stay breathable and are so soft you'll sleep like a baby every single night. That's because these sheets are made from the best in class bamboo rayon, the holy grail of sheeting. This miracle material transfers body heat two times more effectively than regular sheets and reduces humidity by 50% so you can experience your best night's sleep yet. But don't just take my word for it. Go experience the magic of My Sheets Rock yourself and enjoy the luxurious softness that'll make you feel like you're sleeping on a bed of angels. It's an experience that words are pretty hard to capture, so you gotta feel it to truly believe it for yourself. And with a 90-day risk-free trial and free shipping and returns, there's really no reason to not embark on this dreamy journey. Visit MySheetsRock.com slash TNQ and enter our code TNQ to enjoy 10% off and free shipping. That's MySheetsRock.com. That was a big, it took me years to realize how big of an impact that had on my life. I think I'm still to this day, but, you know, seeing those guys and having your best friends go, I mean, JT, we moved out and JT bought a house and we lived together. And so you, you want know. to explain what happened, what, what we're talking about when it, when it comes to that, what the, the details on it, it was a helicopter went down with a bunch of our buddies on it. Yeah. It's Chinook impressive. went down with an entire troop, a third of our squadron. So there's a tick going on, right? There's a tick yeah, tick. Rangers were in there. Rangers were in contact. I, I mean, I don't know the, I mean, I just know that I think they, some guys squirted. I think the, the guy we were going after, I think they, they, they saw him leave and they knew where he's going. And so our guys launched to kind of come in for backup and go for it. And they were just set up ready. I, I mean, from the story, I mean, it's just one of those lucky is not a good word to use. It's a shitty word, but that's kind of just what happened. I guess some dude stepped out in the dark at night with an RPG and, fired it off and ended up hitting the rear rotor and you know those guys were a couple hundred feet up still coming in that just dropped it dropped it out of the sky obviously that was, i mean that shot right nobody yeah, walks away from a helicopter nobody crash. walked away i mean it was yeah i mean uh you got airplane fuel explosives solid stuff i mean the rangers were awesome they they broke contact and like humped all night like running secured the crash they were on target for like two or three days getting stuff off of there Bodies, everything, you know. We met after that. We met. Obviously, we flew into where they were at. There was a big ceremony in Bagram, and then we had to fly to their to their base and pack up all their stuff. You know, like nobody was left to do that. Yeah. So, which is just a freaky thing. You know, you walk in and you're walking into your buddy's room that's set up like he just walked out. Right. You know, computers are still open and beds are. You know, everything's just. Uh, as right. they left it to go walk and do the op, as we all do, expecting to come back, I suppose, you know, maybe, but it was just, you know, it's tough. And we all, I remember during that time, they sent a bunch of psychs out, chaplains and stuff, obviously to talk with us, which I don't think anybody used, you yeah. know, at that time. I, if there's one thing I think we're good at, it's just stuffing emotion down to that box, yeah, you know, yeah. and just shutting that lid is like packing that suitcase and stepping on it and closing it as fuel right it's, it yeah out. it's yeah that's one use for it i guess, in a good way but um i mean shoot i remember being there i don't think i showered for like a week we were up there because i don't think i was sober for a week and uh, i remember one of the guys walked in the room i was laying on one of the guys beds and i remember he started like dry heaving he was like it smells like somebody just threw up in here i did <laughs> and i was like know. dude i just took my shoes off i'm sorry like i think that finally motivated me to shower but uh you, know, you pick up and you carry on and we stayed overseas there and um so we you know obviously we weren't home for the funerals and stuff like that you come home and you just you have each other you know the guys that you guys and the guys that all know that part of it but there wasn't a whole lot of talking about it and i think unfortunately i think shoving that much in that container for me at one time kind of kind of cracked it and those kind of emotions to be honest 
uh, they they become toxic over time. Like I just uh, not talking about it. Um, over the next three and a half years, I can look back and I can see like it really, really affected me. Like I, it kind of stopped me throughout my entire career, man. I've always wanted to be the best. I've strived to be there and I've been very lucky. Like I've, I made it through buds as an original, like I never got rolled. I luckily didn't get injured. I went to dev group, same thing. A lot of guys didn't make it. I made it like I was, I was very blessed, but I also never dealt with a lot of adversity. I know it sounds weird because we go through buds and that sucks and you deal with that. But like, pain and suffering I can deal with, you know, you, you get good at yeah, yeah. putting them down. I think maybe that's what unites us all is we're good at you know, pain and suffering. We'll just tuck that away and keep trucking. But, you know, fast forward, I, I kind of put myself in this bubble. Like I just, I stopped, I became an, it's, I, I call it like a comfort zone, except it wasn't very comfortable. People wouldn't imagine it was comfortable, but it was where I was comfortable. And unfortunately, I wasn't comfortable getting outside of there. And I mean, one of the things we do as team guys is, is better ourselves constantly. And I kind of stopped doing that. I mean, I was back home. I mean, I could think I could count on my old two hands. I could count on them. Back when you had two hands? Back when I had two hands, I could count on them. Like the amount of days, like I was sober probably, you know, like I would get off work and I would just drink. I was always, that was my coping method. And luckily I met my wife during this time, which, you know, she's a savior. It helped a little bit, but. I still was just, I couldn't get out of it. You know, it's hard to talk about weakness and stuff like that in, in this place I was. And obviously it's amazing that I stuck around that long, but it, it got to the point that it just, it affected my job and my performance. And, you know, kind of like I'm a big baseball fan, like major league baseball, they came to me and said, you ain't cutting it, you know, which is the reality. Yeah. We deal with people's lives and, and I let, I mean, in my mind, you know, it, it was, it was time for me to step back and step down and, and reorganize myself. And that was a huge blow to me for the first time was like real failure. You know, I feel like I failed my teammates. I failed myself. I just never been in that part. And I didn't, I didn't know where to go. It's, it's, it's a very humbling experience. Sure. Yeah, and I've no, been humbled, but not like that. There's no bottom to that. You just keep falling. Keep there falling. Is, you're right. Keep and luckily in this couple of weeks, after when I'm getting ready to, you know, head back to the West Coast and get on with it, I, I my commanding officer at the time uh, was an awesome guy, and he pulled me into the office and he kind of just gave me some words. He's like, "Dude, this isn't this isn't the end all be all here, man. There's a, there's a lot more to this life, and you need to make sure that you know you figure out what it is and square it away." And yeah. that was a big eye opener for me. And so I, it was a for me it was a great transition. My wife was pregnant, you know, I was about to become a father. I got to, I went back to the West Coast and took over, over with the air cell. And that next kind of three years was a huge growth period for me personally and as a leader and a person. Like, I think as growing up as a young guy, a young SEAL, like I never wanted to train. I never wanted to be a buds instructor. I always had this thing. Oh, I was just like, lie, you know, you want to operate, operate, uh, yeah. operate. And when I finally got put into this position to teach, it kind of reignited that that old flame I had to keep bettering myself. And not only better myself, but pass down that knowledge and make these guys better. Yeah. There's something empowering about making other people better and lifting them up. Yeah, that's one great thing about our program. And I don't even know if they designed it like that when they developed it, but there's so many things throughout the program that are so beneficial. One of them is that. Yeah. I mean, the, the way new, new warriors get their fire is getting trained by the old ones. Dude, the mentorship program yeah. is hands down you don't get any better than you do in the SEAL teams, I think. I, I have been very blessed to have great, great mentors, platoon chiefs, team leaders. I mean, there are, I mean, it really, there's a point even after being, you know, a dev group for five years, I still felt like I was nothing. Like, because I looked around at the guys I, that were next to me and I'm like, dude, these are the guys. I, I want to be like these guys. Still. Right. Like, I'm not there yet. You know, I just, that's the place where we all should want to be. But, I found this, it started this growth period for me. It started growing. And I, I, like I said, I went back to my wife, put a boot in my ass finally to get back to school. I've been talking about finishing up my degree for ages, you know, kid, I'm brand new father, which was awesome. That's best thing of all time. Yeah, you got uh, She's wonderful. I mean, she saved my life more than one time, but uh, during this period, I was back training with a really good friend of mine and he had started a nonprofit called the seal future fund which is now the SEAL Future Foundation. They changed their name. But 
he had taken it over and the, the goal of this SFF was to help SEALs transition out of the military, whether that was to more education or finding a job on the outside. Excuse me. He had just gotten a great job offer back on the East Coast that he couldn't turn down. And so he came to me and said, you know, if I take this job, will you take over the SFF as a CEO? That was kind of a big, you know, we work in small teams. I, uh, being a leader, to me at that point, I was like, man, I'm good with 20, 30 guys. But now you're talking about taking some of the weight off the entire community. community yeah. like, like that's a scary thought too, to like let guys down that way. And, but I talked about it, talked with the family, talked about it with him and just, and we agreed that I would do it. So got permission from the, you know, I had to get permission from the West coast, from the Commodore and everything to take on like a dual, dual job. I was still teaching skydiving, but luckily with the class schedule, I had a lot of downtime to, for school and taking this over. And then on top of that, you know, I got into the Harvard program that Morgan and I have been through. That's an executive education program through Harvard Business School. Harvard Todd. And That's right. Uh, I got mine. Don't think I don't. Yeah, and the scarf is that. Yeah. <laughs> but, barely, uh, barely got out of high school, quit college, got into SEAL teams, Harvard grad. <laughs> yeah, essentially, if you fast forward like that. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that, Isn't that a great way of looking at it? I mean, my resume looks good. When you I say think. it like that, you're like, <laughs> hold on, wait a minute. So like, I came from Nowheresville, Virginia. I barely got through high school. I dropped out of college. Yeah. Community college. I dropped community, community college. college. <laughs> and now I'm a Harvard graduate. Yeah, now that you're a Harvard grad, you got to make the first part seem as miserable as possible. <laughs> and there's two ways to get that education through life, right? You spend most of it in the... Because look at the first 40 years is just your education. Yeah. Like people spend it in the building. And then when you walk in and say, hey, that diploma, when you look at that, it's supposed to tell you how smart that person is, right? Yeah. That's what that... That's their, their trident, if you will. Man, you can do it the way we did it. Just go out there and your resume is on your body, your scars, and, and it tells your story. And then at the end of that, you sit down in that building and see how much you learn throughout life and how many of them things you can stack up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Totally. Um, it's funny. It's funny because we talk about the school thing and, you know, being a SEAL. But I'll be honest, one of my biggest fears through the teams was going back to school. I mean, I didn't, like I said, I didn't do any college. I remember being in that classroom a little bit and I had talked about taking classes like after my first platoon, I was like, oh man, free, you know, free education. I get in some classes and I don't know, this fear of like being back in a classroom with kids that were younger than me and in my head, smarter than me. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. I just thought about like math and doing fractions, <laughs> just stupid shit. But I mean, that fear kept you from doing it, disabled me yeah. in a sense. And I just, I, I always found an excuse to, to skip it. Mm. Vol I'd volunteer. I'd rather, you know, I'd rather be deployed overseas. I'd volunteer for deployment. I'd take a school, take training. And I, the excuse was always, well, I'm doing this. I don't have time for that. Like, this is my focus. Like the SEAL teams are my focus. Like school will come in. And in the beginning, of course, I thought I'd just do it forever. Yeah, of course. And you're like, what do I need school for? I'll just do it forever. But you know, if that's one piece of advice I could give the younger guys. It's like, man, use, use what you got while you're in and get mm -hmm. that education, man. And like, You'll regret it if you don't. Well, in the program that we were in, man, youth is your tool when I mean, you can't do it on the back end. Yeah. That's why it's designed that way. So if you if you decide to go that route, that military route, and people talking about free college, and literally if you, everything that we're, we're sitting in and everything that we've accomplished is because we threw that uniform on. And then it just, one door led to another. And it started with just the regular education, like 3M, or, you know, just yeah. something, uh, load planner. Yeah whatever schools they would throw at you. And that's literally sitting in the classroom and doing the school deal. And, it, and by doing that, it teaches you how to go sit in, in the regular classroom. Yeah. All right. So, so go on where baby girls on the day. Yeah. So, I mean, just, you know, at this point I'm, I'm training skydivers. I'm running a nonprofit and I'm, I'm in school when the Harvard, I mean, I was, I was starting to find my balance in there and then a couple more things got thrown on, but, I, I was passionate about all of them and I wanted to get my education. So when the Harvard thing came up, it was, I was like, yo, am I actually accepted this program? <laughs> Did they look at my past school records? <laughs> but, uh, well, shout out to that program. Wait, and, hey, hey, and Lisa right? Hughes. Hey, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, Lisa's Lisa, we love you. I mean, she is a game changer over there. She's a patriot, loves our guys, knows what we're bringing to that table. That, that whole program does. Um, so I ended up getting to that program, put the, undergrad on a, on a hold and started doing the Harvard route, which was just an amazing 
life changing life changing education yeah. well, extra well, extra life changing for me obviously because as we were talking about in the beginning that's where smack dab in the middle of that program um is when i got in an accident yeah let's hear about that let's hear about <laughs> greatest that guy. story ever uh yeah so geez i guess that story starts off paint the picture in the mood the, should we put yeah i mean that, uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what kind of music you draw use. curtains yeah. i mean it'd be hard because it's kind of <laughs> it's comical but but uh i every year after thanksgiving i'd go out to a ranch out here in texas uh with a couple guys a couple of teammates that were out now and we'd do some sniper work with guys just for fun end up becoming a bunch of good friends of ours so uh, i think this is like the third year come out to do it Are you ready to elevate your health and wellness journey? Look no further than iHerb, your ultimate destination for curated wellness products. From supplements to sports nutrition, iHerb has got you covered every which way possible. Personally, I can't recommend iHerb enough. Their commitment to quality and transparency is unmatched in the industry. They go above and beyond to ensure that everything that's inside of the bottle is exactly what it's supposed to be. It's a brand that I truly rely on for all of my health and wellness needs. Now let's talk sports nutrition. With so many options out there, it can be kind of overwhelming to find products that truly deliver. And that's where iHerb comes into play. Their nutrition collection is truly top tier. We're talking everything from multivitamins to L-glutamine to stimulants, snack bars, creatine, electrolytes, and so many more options. My personal favorites are the fish oils I have and the alpha brain capsules to keep me focused and motivated all day long. And with over 24 million authentic reviews and over a million five-star ratings, iHerb has helped so many customers find the best products for their needs. Join the iHerb community and experience the difference for yourself. Now, here's the exciting part. For a limited time, new customers can get a fantastic 22% off their entire order with our exclusive offer. Just go to iHerb.com and use our promo code TNQ at the checkout. That's 22% off your order at i. Um, it was a Tuesday morning. I think it was the 28th. Uh, we're getting up in the morning. Feeders go off or whatever. You know, these guys are just sitting in stands and shooting. And- I'm getting up and I'm driving down to the bunkhouse where all our gear was just to grab my stuff and come back up. And I mean, I, I think I was about a spot. I, I don't know. The story kind of changes. I think I was about a mile away, but I was in a, in a curve and ended up losing control and just rolling that as a side by side. I don't know what that was, but that's your belly again. No. Nah. <laughs> down boy. Uh, the dog dropped out because they're gone. Oh, that's going to go on for a while. Quiet. <laughs> My dog doesn't bark when I leave. Yeah, probably be good. You know what? I'm gonna text Leslie and see if she can let him out. Didn't you used to get in trouble for those those guys? He'd sit out in the front yard all day. Yeah, somebody took him. One of my neighbors took him. She's like, I just felt so sorry for him. I had to take him. <laughs> like he was barking and what? You know, the you were living with me when I yeah. yeah. Hmm. I just thought he was gonna lose his voice. He was crying for you. <laughs> lose his voice. I'm like, bitch, you steal my dog. <laughs> She's like I, cuddling with him. Yeah, actually, he's I, got like a wig on. I, Gus is wearing like a wig at the house. I muzzled him <laughs> for a while, so he wouldn't. He's like, <laughs> then I, that's, so after that, I was like, "All right, buddy, I'll board you." So I'd, I'd take him, and that was a pricey boarding expense. couple of weeks. Couple of yeah. Months. yeah, they loved him at that little school I sent him to. All right, let's. All right, so it should be good. Yeah. So uh, morning of the twenty eighth, Tuesday morning, like I said, get up at five something in the morning head down to the bunkhouse get our stuff and i end up rolling a side by side and uh how'd you do that honestly i mean i wouldn't haul an ass but obviously speed was a little bit of a factor but i was just trying to get down there and i was in a curve dirt gravel path thin path too so like i couldn't counter and drive off the path i would have crashed into a tree so i just once that ass end started to lose traction i just started pumping the brakes and trying to lean in and you know you know that point in your head because like you could feel it in your yeah. equilibrium when that back tire just dug in and it yeah. just hit that point and I said I'm going over, and obviously I, it's a new vehicle I didn't know where the 
no door, you know, and I didn't know where the handles were, but I just gripped that steering wheel as tight as I could. And when it hit on its side, it jarred me to the ground, but I had, I mean, I just had a little scratch on my forehead, scratch on my ankle, but essentially as I slid a couple feet, I was doing like a side plank to keep my face from just getting destroyed. So I had my weight on my forearm and I saw my arm snap. Like I'm looking down at my, obviously adrenaline's pumping, but I'm, I see my wrist and my elbow get closer together. I'm like, shit, I just broke my arm. <laughs> so I oh, stopped. God. Well, I stopped and, you know, you do a quick mental mm -hmm. checklist and I'm like, whoo, like broken arm. That's fine. I've broken my arm before. Like, this is easy. Like, and I, I just stood up. And when I stood up, I mean, my hand, it was still attached, but only because of like piece of skin, my, the skin on the top that hadn't got eroded away. Right. I mean, flesh and bone were gone and my hand was hanging like a fishing pole. Oh, God. And I mean, That's blood awesome. everywhere at this point. And I'm looking. And I, I mean, I remember yelling to myself. I was like, out loud. I was just like, fuck. <laughs> like, it wasn't that connection hadn't hit yet. Like, in my head, I was okay. Yeah. But I'm looking at this and I'm like, this is a game changer. <laughs> 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 like, awesome, uh, this isn't like I'm just going to limp back up there. Like, <laughs> oh, shit's got to happen. But life has changed. Yeah. It I mean, right you know, now. fucking Murphy's Law. You know, if it yeah. can't happen, it will happen at the worst possible time for us. So, you know, I'm by myself. My phone has been flung out of the vehicle. I mean, I mean, I knew where it was, thank God. But you probably know where luckily, there. shout out to my brother, Hannah for Jones, Charo. He gave me this Jack Daniels belt years ago, this soft leather belt. It's kind of a weird story there. If, if I back up the day I was leaving for that trip, had all my stuff packed, my wife and daughter at home. I already got the Uber. The Uber's like parked outside. And I'm like, my belt was on the banister of our stairs like the night before. And I go to grab it and it's not there. And I'm like, Mindy, I'm like, where's my belt? Because I know she gets in these cleaning modes. Yeah. The world, the tornado comes through. Yeah. And of course, she doesn't even know where she puts stuff. She cleans so much. And so I'm like, where's the belt? And she's like, I don't know. Just get another belt. And it, like, for some reason, whatever, the Almighty was looking out for me. Like, it, I kind of got angry. I was like, where's my effing belt? You know, I'm like, I need that belt. She's like, why? I'm like, because I love it, you know, just get it for me. So she, luckily she found it. I put that belt on out the door. Fast forward to this point, I'm wearing this belt, thank God, because I'm telling you, the other belts I had, stiff leather, they would not have worked. This was like a soft leather belt. This was meant to happen. And I just, it, in a split second, luckily my mind went to like survival mode. Cor the Corman in you. The Corman in me, man. I whipped this fucking belt off and I'm with my mouth, you know, I loop it through and I have to dangle my hand. <laughs> You know, remember yeah. that old fish? Remember that old fishing game oh, yeah. Yeah, with the fishing yeah, yeah. pole and the, oh, and the yeah. fish are coming out. You know, trust me, man. It took me a couple of tries uh, to get that, get that hand in there. By now, or, or no, I mean, I'm telling you, no pain whatsoever. I mean, because I mean, I'm getting like yeah. I knew, I knew the situation I was in, like fully. I knew that I'm I do something or I'm not going to make it. So I get my hand in there. I whip this thing up. I pull this thing as tight as I can, and of course, the first thing I do is like start running. And I, I don't know, about 10 yards before I said, hold up. Um, Bad idea. Because I'm like, I, I can't tell. I mean, obviously blood's still dripping everywhere. I can't tell. I mean, I, I'm hoping I stopped the bleeding. As, I stopped as best I could, but there's still blood. So I ended up having to like do an extra wrap and bite this thing. Like I put this belt in my mouth to bite it and keep it tight. And then I have to pick my hand up with my other hand because my uh, hand is swinging like a freaking. Mm. So I'm like holding my hand, which is a weird feeling. <laughs> I'm like yeah. holding your kind of almost detached hand. But. I ended up just being like, in my mind, I knew it was just like kind of tunnel vision, but I was like, move with a purpose and get back to the house where the guys are at. You know, I had to get back up there. So like I said, for me, I think it's about a mile. It's like a William Wallace story. It always grows. I've heard sure. two miles, like 10 miles, whatever, but I think it was about a mile. 200 miles. So, yeah. We're in a marathon. <laughs> but uh, I get back to the house and the funny part was this, this ranch house was so freaking nice sliding doors everywhere and they were kind of cracked and guys are up and i kicked this door with my feet i didn't even go in the house i think i didn't want to dirty the house up because i'm like bloody and i was that's the, polite the guys are looking at me and i just go you know call 911 and they're like what and i'm like <laughs> fucking call 911 and i can see their faces when they finally put the whole picture together yeah. it. and they're like they just start running to me and i just kind of went down to the ground like i laid down in this mulch and shit and they came out and luckily they were great. I talked to them in, like we had med kits out there. And so I was like, Hey, first thing I did was talk them into putting like another tourniquet on my arm, like an actual cat tourniquet. Mm. First pain I felt he's putting that cat tourniquet on. And there was a guy out there that worked the ranch who was, I mean, he had to be 300 pounds. This, I mean, he's like six, six, 300 pounds. He put in, they were like, 
grab that belt and don't let him bleed out. Yeah. He put a knee on my shoulder and he pulled that belt so freaking tight, man. That I mean, that was that was the first pain I felt. Oh. But they've had blankets on me, and then uh, I my memory blanks out as soon as the ambulance showed up, which was about thirty minutes. So I remember them calling nine one one. I remember hearing it's thirty minutes for the ambulance. People talk about life flight. It was you know five thirty six in the morning. It's too foggy for life flight. Yeah. It was one of those mornings. So ambulance picks me up. I sort of go out. I think my adrenaline was dumping at that point. Although. There's a sheriff's deputy that we keep in touch with. She was one of the first responders and she was on the ambulance with me initially. And she said, I turned into like a crazy man. Like they had IVs in me and I'm ripping shit out. And I'm like, I think I was just freaking out. Like everything dumped and I was just oh. shock was setting in. But they had everybody holding me down and I finally got into town. The life flight nurses, the trauma nurses swapped them out. And then we continued on to San Antonio. At some point in there, you know, I think I started to go. They got me to the hospital. And of course, my next memory from the ambulance is waking up in the hospital. And I'm waking up, coming to obviously they've already done the amputation, so they have. Well, you a, pretty much took care of that, right? They just had to clean her up. <laughs> they just they just snip it up and clean it up. Really, yeah. they did, and thank God they actually did an awesome job. So talking to my surgeon later, uh, a lot was dependent on how clean that wound was because it was up close to the elbow. Oh. And luckily, that doc, I don't know the main doc's name, but funny part of the story is when i'm waking up one of the other doctors a younger guy was there talking to me and this guy's name is dr hand <laughs> so thank you dr uh, hand but I, even mindy got a laugh at that one we're uh, like is this guy serious not? like really you're the one talking to me and he's going through this story of you know we had to amputate yada 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 and then, so my wife is there and then two old seal buddies of mine and in this story this is where it gets good right yeah, yeah in this story as he's telling him I don't even remember who my wife, but one of the guys is like, Hey doc, you know, where's his hand? Where is his hand? And I don't even remember the response. Cause I'm kind of drugged up, but I, I'm essentially, he's like, well, it's probably going down to get destroyed morgue. Yeah, down the morgue. And it's like, can we have it? And the doc, I, remember, I mean, I can kind of remember the doctor's face. He's kind of like, what? And they're like, yeah, can we have the hand? And so now I'm just like, Please. yeah, can I keep it? <laughs> and he's like, I don't know guys. He's like, it would have to be like a religious reason. And of course we're like done bingo. <laughs> I said, we got to bury that thing. It's, it's that's the piece of me. This is, this is where I, I, it has to go. I have this religious belief that I, if I don't bury it. It's a religion. You don't know the name of it won't find, but me believe afterlife. me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna need this. I have to get buried with this thing. One this day. is where the story so, really gets good. So anyway, he's like, look, I I'll, I'll, I'll ask. I don't, you know, so he comes back a couple hours later and he's like, Hey, you can pick the hand up tomorrow. So, that night, we're over getting swapped over to the military hospital at BAMC and, you know, stay there. The next day, two of my buddies, well, one, of, well, at least my one buddy that I know of, they go back to, the, I mean, and this guy, he's no relation to me, doesn't share a name with me, whatever, uh. <laughs> but goes back and they just hand off this, hand it off. They just uh, hand off hand my off hand. I don't know. Allow myself to introduce myself. myself. Um, my hand. Yeah. They hand off the hand to my buddy. And so... You know, everybody at this point, like more seals have flown in, good buddies of mine, everybody's flying in to make sure I'm okay. And uh, so they're like, well, what do we do with the hand? They're all staying like a, a Spring Hill Suites Marriott or something like that, you know? <laughs> so they stick it in the freezer. It's a natural <laughs> yeah, the course. You know? at the hotel room. In the, yeah, yeah, in the hotel room. Yeah, so there's a bunch of guys in the hotel. That this guy puts it in the freezer. This goes, this is where you can't make this stuff. Comes up. back to the hospital. And so this, this goes on. I mean, the hospital was great. I mean, I know talking about never quit story you know you think like losing this hand it's devastating the chance to ever really feel bad about the hand never came up right. you know like i mean it's funny because i mean you you guys you guys visited and you saw the staff i spent about two weeks in like this four west and that staff there's amazing and yeah. they freaking loved us right. i mean we had a party going on they finally gave me my own room because they're like there's too many people here you're bothering everybody else no, yeah. no, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the, like the hand jokes were flying. Right, right. I mean, there's just, I think even the nurses were just like, they're like, I don't think this is how you're supposed to talk to people who just got injured. Yes, you know? it, is. Yeah, it is. But Absolutely. there's no other way to do it in yeah. our community because you just, I mean, everything's comical, but it's also, I'm like, the first thing I did was like, hey, I'm alive. You know, I get to go home and I get to see my wife. I get to see my daughter. I, I, get, I carry on no matter what. And so originally they were telling me, hey, I had more bone than I had skin and muscle to cover it up. 
So they, I had this wound back on for weeks and they said, you know, every, every doctor I talked to was like, Hey, you're probably going to lose your elbow. We can't cover it up. You're probably going to lose it. And of course the mindset at that point is just like, dude, whatever. Like, let's get this thing over with. Like, yeah. I don't, I didn't know any better at the time of being an amputee, but I'm like, I'm alive. Let's just, I want to get out of the hospital. Let's just do this thing. So when the surgeon, uh, my surgeon came in, I mean, he's still active. I don't want to use his name, but best surgeon in the world. He came in and he was like, Hey, I'm going to MacGyver this shit. and I'm going to save your elbow. I'm like, fantastic. Yeah. So I like this attitude. Yeah, so we did a couple more surgeries to make sure everything was cleaned up. Obviously, parallel to this is the guys. The hand is still in the freezer. In the freezer. <laughs> during the day, the guys are all at the hospital during the day. We're all coking and joking, having a great time. At night, these guys are going back, and I'm getting pictures with oh, it. Oh, yeah. Are, it's a party with the hand. It's yeah, a party, yeah. yeah. People, guys are, them, guys are popping, the hand. taking selfies. <laughs> People are shaking my hand, making videos with, with the it. With the hand. <laughs> with the, the, I have pictures on Which my is funny, because honestly, when you look at it, I got, it's kind of gnarly. It's disgusting. It is real it's gnarly. Disgusting. Oh yeah. I mean, it looks like a prop, but it's just like the skin is all wrinkled. Yeah, yeah. It's just like it, like it's it's dying, you know. And you're like, yeah. and I don't it's, even. Got, think... It's like wearing a glove that's too big. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, tell tell the tell the best part. So yeah. So anyway, yeah. Um, it's probably been like a week, and one of my buddies has to leave, and the hand is in his freezer for whatever reason, and so he goes to the front desk. And he's like, hey, can I get a key, you know, a room key to this other room? I have something I need to put in there. And they're like, well, no, but here, give it to us and we'll put it in there for you. And he's like, uh, oh, no, no. And so I guess, I don't know if it was like the weird reaction to it, yeah. like him just walking away and whatever else that evening, uh, the hand stayed in that freezer because somebody else is going to use the room. But the maid or the manager, somebody the goes maid, in there the and maid finds, in. The, maid the, finds the hand. Clean out the freezer. That's the greatest story. There's a human hand <laughs> in the freezer. Oh, damn hand in there? Yeah, so... <laughs> that poor lady. I'm sure this is not what is in the job description of, like, cleaning out body parts. You but look on her face like, what is that? I wish I could see it. I wish I could have been able to find the wall. But, um, obviously, they call the police. It's oh, yeah. a natural thing to do. There's a, there's a body part there's a body here. part in my freezer. And, this, and the guy who had the room is kind of a... <laughs> Like a strangely acting fellow. Yeah, right. My bad. So the police show up there and they like it's funny because the hotel at the hotel like knew we were all there for whatever reason. They call the hospital and the hospital staff is like, hey, hotel, like you gotta go back. The police are there. So the two two of my buddies are like the guy with the hand, the other guy that knows about the hand, like they end up going back there. And I don't know, 30, 45 minutes later, I had a telephone in my room next to my bed you know like to the outside world and all of a sudden it rings i'm like hello it's like hey this is detective so-and-so you know and i'm like hey detective are you, you missing know? a hand <laughs> well he didn't even ask me i just jumped into it because i'm like i don't know if these guys are like getting headed up arrested right. i'm like hey detective like hey my name's aaron kennel you know like this is that's my hand here's the story so wait, i got a hand i'm missing my foot where, where, where the hell did they get that <laughs> yeah yeah you got a foot there i should have i should have asked for yeah, my yeah, body yeah. parts i know i got them all good man. yeah hindsight being 2020 i should have messed <laughs> a little bit more but i was just trying to make sure guys like weren't in trouble so uh i said those are my, i gave my buddies names so those are my buddies i don't know you can come test me whatever those are my fingerprints <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're still there i don't i'm sure you can take dna but yeah. i mean he was like hey it's all good we we just need to make sure this wasn't a homicide you know <laughs> <laughs> so it's all good so at that point obviously now it's weird that there's a body part in the hotel. And so if the, the qu next question is like, well, what do we do with it now? It can't stay here. So the next logical answer became, well, let's take it to a taxi. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so uh, obviously out back out towards Kerrville where all we did all the hunting and yeah, we got uh, plenty of taxidermists. Yeah, plenty of taxidermists and guys that the guys knew. So they bring it back there. And uh, I wish I knew who they would. I'd give them a shout out. They did an awesome job. Um, and I think they put it to the front of the line, being as they were like, "Hey, we don't get to work on human stuff. Human, human so hands. We don't get to do yeah, a lot of Jim, humans I here." He was so, just like looking at that thing, going, "Hmm." <laughs> <laughs> I think they were excited for it, but uh, either way, so hand goes to the taxidermist, and they asked me like, "What do you want?" And so the initial plan that I wanted <laughs> shoulder mount. Well, yeah, half, the initial past, plan I wanted was out. to uh, obviously, like, I'm a big wine drinker. I <laughs> consider myself like an aficionado a little bit, but I wanted to make it like a. I don't know. It's hard to see, but. Like a skeleton hand doing like the Spock thing where I could hold a wine glass with like a stem. <laughs> you know, so if I was at a party, I could bring this hand and hold wine and my sip hand. out of it. Yeah. My hand. Uh, I quickly realized that they couldn't do it because they have to drill through, put wire. It becomes very brittle. Like it's not, uh, it's uh, not weight bearing at all. So I finally got it back in January of this year. 
it's in a beautiful like i could describe it as like the beauty and the beast like forever rose you know, they have, exactly. you know like yeah like they, snow globed. They, they got it like in a nice rock there that they chisel my bones you can see right where the bone snapped you know still all there my hands there it's and it's just i can vouch for that i've had the hand in my hand yeah i don't think they knew exactly what to use for because obviously now it's this obviously my wife doesn't let me keep it out in public it's in our closet it's in our closet yeah, yeah, yeah. but when people come over and kids my daughter loves it it's a great conversational piece. It's a great conversation piece so people come over and i bust it out and like i chase kids around with it and play tag and <laughs> it's gotten caught in hair and all sorts of stuff for I think I need to take it back because, like, the glue in between all the bones. There's a lot of bones in your hand. <laughs> the yeah. glue in there is, like, starting to come apart. Like, at some part, I feel like this hand's going to start to fall apart. So I'm going to need to. It's going to be an heirloom forever. Yeah, for Halloween, you just put on, like, the trench coat. Remember, was it Zoolander? He, the guy, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Put, he had he put it in there. there. <laughs> got a hand model. But I suppose, uh, for Halloween. you know, I'm looking at stuff. If You know, obviously, there's a lot in there where people. I remember when I started to go to rehab at the CFI, which is the best facility in, in the country. You know, it's. They have the best staff, the best people. I couldn't ask to be in a better place. In fact, one of the doctors said it to me one of the mornings when they came in super early. Because I'm a Navy guy. The doctor goes, you you stationed here? I said, no. He's like, what are you doing here? I said, I got in the accident here. And he looked dead at me. And he goes, you picked a good place to get in an accident. Mm -hmm. And that's true. And so I end up, my command let me stay out here to rehab. Just fantastic. But I remember my surgeon, a couple other people were like, man, I, I can't wait for you to get over to the CFI. Because there are people that accidents happen to and their their attitude you know like they just they feel like they're in despair like this this thing happened to them and it affects them luckily you know looking back on my life and all the downside to it was perspective you know like mm. like i said my perspective was a i'm alive and my plan is to get back as best as i can be you know i tell people like i had a plan a my plan a was to live my life with two hands man mm. like i love that left hand we've been through a lot of shit together right <laughs> But literally plan a is no longer possible so you can sit there and you can you can dwell on how great plan a would have been it would have been great trust me i have great plans but you know now it's time to move on to plan b i didn't have a plan b but i created one mm. and if plan b doesn't work i'm going to create a plan c but you know I, I went in there every day with the attitude of making myself better and there's great people over there but they were excited for my attitude to come over there and hopefully become infectious and mm. and work hard and get back like this this accident doesn't define me, you know. In fact, I people all the time like, "Oh man, how is it?" I'm like, "Well, it ain't that bad." I mean, I can do pretty much. Everything. I'm sure there's gonna be obstacles in life that are gonna come. Yeah, this is just part of it. Just, there's obstacles with two hands that are gonna come, but yeah. there's just ways. Now my way is just figuring out how to do it as best I can. I always joke because people go, "Where's your prosthetic?" I mean, I've had a prosthetic for like a year and a half. Mm -hmm. I remember going in to see my prosthetist at the CFI, and mm -hmm. he was like, "Hey, have you been using your hand?" I'd say. <laughs> prosthetist oh, yeah. yeah good good articulation not to be totally not to be confused <laughs> <laughs> well he, is, but, uh, he does do hand jobs though <laughs> he does do hand jobs <laughs> but uh he was i remember i hadn't seen saying. him i hadn't seen him in like six months and he's like hey you've been wearing the prosthetic and i was like don't you have the prosthetic he was like oh boy he's like so you haven't worn it one time have you i'm like well i haven't but it's only because i've just figured out ways around it and it's becomes more of a pain to get it on and try to do it than just doing it. You get so, around great. Well, I appreciate that. I, mean, you know? I haven't even seen anything you can't do. Yeah, that's the best part about having team guys, man. Sure when, when cut uh, your steak. When we do get injured, <laughs> it's just like the the overall mentality is, but first, like, hey, man, you put something on there and make me even faster, stronger, kind of turn me into a cyborg. Yeah. But I mean, we've got a couple of buddies that, had, that went to college with one guy. Trey Wood. Trey. God dang, that guy, he could, he like you, played, I mean, that's you, what, he wouldn't he even know he didn't have football, football, yeah. football, lift, he would bench over 300 pounds. Yeah. I woke up this morning and Kendall was outside in the, yard, in the, in the barn rowing. Yeah. And then doing planks. <laughs> yeah, I don't do that and I'm yeah, man, it's, complete. Uh, uh, it's something, brother. Yeah, my wife told me it's time to lose some weight, so I had to get out there. <laughs> no, just kidding. But, uh, I mean, and a shout out to my wife and my daughter, you know, they've, they've been, behind me and and that's one of the biggest things too is when i got out of that hospital i mean they're like don't move your arm i got staples in i mean my daughter doesn't realize that i'm injured you know when i walked in that door it's it's dad time again right. like and that was a i mean there's no more motivating factor than that right there to like be the father that you were want to be you know and the husband you want to be and so 
you know, when I came back, every time I'd see him in rehab, I'd be like, I'm lifting my arm over my head. And they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I'm like, trust me, I'm not going to injure myself. I know the difference there, but I'm going to push myself every day to get back to normal. Like, I know that you have a timeline, but I have a timeline too. And I know that I can do better than what you're telling me. But man, just being, being in that place every day, I mean, forget the SEALs. There was a civilian lady in there that she had to be on here. She was like a sheriff's deputy. And she woke up one morning in writhing pain. And they called an ambulance. And when she woke up at the hospital, they amputated all four of her limbs. She had some virus that was killing her. And she, they amputated all four. And I see her there every day at rehab. Above and below joints? or Uh, I think mostly below, but I don't, don't quote me on that. But she's getting prosthetics, but I've seen her in a chair with her, with her dog. And she is at that rehab center every freaking day, man. And I'm just like, now we need to get her on the show, dude. I'm telling you, I mean, that's the kind of you look at that and you're like, I always make the analogy. You've seen, uh, was it half baked? Yeah. You know, in Bob Saget's, he goes to AA and uh, whatever, and he's talking about smoking weed and being addicted to weed. And Bob Saget stands up and he's like, I don't want to, you know, you know he's like, you ever <laughs> suck dick yeah, for yeah. coke? You know, <laughs> he's like, that's not a drug. Like that's kind of how I, like when people ask me, like, oh man, it's so terrible. I'm like, dude, it's a hand, like. I've run marathons with these guys. I did a marathon with a bunch of other amputees. And, you know, these guys are like, F you, Kendall. He's got two legds. Forget about this guy. Like, you know, <laughs> right. it's, it's, not, it's not a thing. That's why, you know, my, my mindset is just, it's not there. I mean, it's not there, but I mean, it's just everything is normal. And I just, every day is just better than it was before. And sure. I, honestly, awesome. it's a challenge now. I try to outperform people. You know, it's, it's fun to do stuff and people are like, oh, shit. You know, where's your hands? Like, ah, fuck. Anybody can do that with two hands. Try to do it with one and a half. That's right. I had a buddy of mine here recently, one of the Green Rays who pulled me off the uh, mountain. Yeah. He loves riding motorcycles. And he's a little bit older, but he was in a crash um, recently and he's, he got paralyzed from the waist down. And I went to see him the other day. Uh, and um, with anything, he was kind of down on himself. I was like, hey, man, let's just put this in perspective, all right? And I was like, you got a new set of wheels here. How much time do you spend on that motorcycle? Then when you're at home, you're sitting down. I was like, man, now you got permanent wheels. You love to <laughs> ride anyways, man. You soup this thing up. There's not. And then the, the in between stuff. Man, that just draws you close to your family, right? I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's okay to. A lot of times with guys like us, it's that pride that we're not we can't fulfill our our duties. But man, that's just you doing thinking about that. Just yeah, I mean, life's funny that way, man. I mean, I like we we joked before we started this. You know, obviously, I live in Texas here now, and and I love it. But for years, you know, Morgan have been you guys have been talking about hey, when you get out, come to Texas, and I was always yeah. like. No, nope. <laughs> Texas ain't for me, man. I'm <laughs> just not my cup of tea. I didn't really want to. And two months after being here, my wife and I, my wife's just like, I love it here. And I'm like, I do too. People are great. Found some great friends. Everybody's close by. And that was kind of the joke that we made earlier. It was like, well, what happened? I, you used to not want to live in Texas. And I was like, well, that was two-handed me. <laughs> yeah. Two-handed me. Two -handed me didn't like Texas. Yeah. One-handed me. And you really enjoys being here in Texas. So. Well, thank you so much for, for coming out and doing and sharing your sharing your weekend with us man and i, I, no, I man, appreciate I, it i love you like a brother yeah never stop living man every time you come in here just damn joy and we did i mean just touching on some of the stuff with what we did today man just those never quit moments it's, it's kind of funny that those don't really define us as what we are man it's it was the lead up to all of that and that kind of that that was just one of the steps in it and that goes it's part of the course of anything you do man and just there's supposed to be some roadblocks Right or hurdles or absolutely or whatever you want to call it, but if you if you don't look at them like that as the barriers as the the, the problem is just as it's just something that we have to get through. Uh, it's like an, if the if life is an obstacle course, the obstacles are set in it, right? Yeah, you, you just and I mean we talked about it earlier. Right. I always tell people like if you look at my resume, man, it looks really good. But what you don't see is in between every one of those <laughs> great bullets is a hmm. bunch of failure, <laughs> Fun. a bunch of hardship. You know, and it's obstacle after obstacle but you know the difference is those aren't my bullets those obstacles and those failures aren't my defining moments it's everything that comes after that that you grow from sure that's what makes you into all that <laughs> those moments if you're already following us on facebook and instagram you know we like to keep our followers up to date with gear sales events guests and tons of other stuff you won't find anywhere else if you aren't following us you are missing out so go check us out at team underscore never quit you can also keep up with Marcus at Marcus Luttrell and Morgan at Mojo Luttrell and me at Hunter O13. This is the Team Never Quit Podcast. Podcast.
the buckle up, Buttercup. <laughs>